Hello, and uh, uh, welcome to another edition of uh, uh, Gastro Learning Live. Um, uh, over the last year, our focus, um, as those who've attended will know, has been on uh, endoscopy matters. Um, but we're just shifting a little bit sideways um, uh, for today's uh, meeting um, to talk about inflammatory bowel disease. Absolutely delighted to um, uh, have my uh, colleague Paul Harrow, uh, consultant colleague at uh, University College uh, Hospital in, in London, uh, uh, with uh, uh, me today. So, Paul, great to have you with us. Now, when I was doing inflammatory bowel disease as a trainee, um, uh, when it came to response to treatment, which is going to be our, our focus over the next 30 minutes, we can't talk about everything. Um, so we're going to focus on, on treatment response. Then, you know, in those days, some time ago, you know, we would ask the patients, you know, what their stool frequency was like. And if it was uh, nicely reduced, we would view that as a treatment response. And um, everybody was happy. Uh, you're going to tell me that it's got more sophisticated than that. Um, so before we get on to the specifics of treatment and, and what we should be thinking about in 2021. Um, tell us about how we should be assessing treatment response. So I think um, for, for lots of reasons that our, our treatment goals have changed. And I think um, particularly thinking about uh, Crohn's disease, but UC as well, I think where the disease is active affects what tests you would use to uh, to assess the response to treatment. So if you have colonic disease, then calprotectin has got uh, good sensitivity and specificity. And I use that uh, to assess response to colonic disease. Um, I think small bowel disease is a bit more difficult. And I think if you saw small bowel disease on an ultrasound or an MRI and the calprotectin was low, which we know it is about three times out of 10 with small bowel disease on its own, then, then you need to do some other uh, some other tests to look for that and some people are unlucky and their Crohn's disease is really difficult to diagnose and we only see it on a video capsule and I think if that's what you use to make the diagnosis and every other test was normal then I think at some point you need to repeat that test to show that your treatment is working. Okay so so it is a, a, a take-home point that the objective parameter that has defined the disease pre-treatment is usually a useful objective parameter to assess treatment response is that a reasonable rule of thumb yeah, absolutely and i think you want to use the cheapest and least invasive test that allows you to detect the disease um, i think when you first get diagnosed you uh, there's an obligation to map out the disease and i think everybody will need a full colonoscopy and patients with crohn's disease will need either an mri small bowel or an ultrasound small bowel but i think uh, picking a modality that's relevant to where the disease is uh, that was abnormal at the time of diagnosis is a is a good starting point for assessing response yeah OK, um, and we're not talking about how we make the diagnosis, but right. you did you did mention cost. Some patients will have their you know, small bowel Crohn's disease diagnosed with capsule endoscopy. Is that a cost effective? Is it a practical way of assessing treatment response? So 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 it's very rare that that test is the only abnormal test in patients with Crohn's. And actually it's, it's about 1% of patients that have a completely normal colonoscopy with ideal intubation and a normal imaging, and yet actually turn out to have Crohn's disease. So, um, so for, for those patients, uh, I, I think you do need to do the test, but for 99% of patients, another test is okay. Okay. Um, and, and again, calprotectin, you know, great for colonic disease, yeah. Why should it be useful in some patients with small bowel disease who have small bowel disease and not in others who are known to have, you know, inflammatory small bowel disease? I, I, I think it's the dilutional effect. And um, I think it, the uh, so, so calprotectin is a neutrophil protein and uh, what, any cause of inflammation in the lining of the gut um Will, will lead to this protein being released, but it does get degraded as it passes along the GI tract and it will get diluted in, in the stool. And so I think the further away you get from the rectum, the, le the less useful it is. Okay, well, that, that's, um, uh, that, that's very interesting. Um, and and um, so the days of, 
um, you know, do we ignore patient symptoms? Uh, you know, if the patient says, oh, well, my, you know, I was having my bowels open eight times a day and now it's five times a day. Um, you know, are we, you know, do you have um, a, a sort of gradation and do, yeah. do clinical trials require a gradation of relevance, if you like, in terms of assessing treatment response? So, so the endpoint in trials actually has shifted and um, many trials now have endpoints which include endoscopic endpoints, so mucosal healing uh, or normalisation of inflammatory markers, although I believe that all trials in Europe and the US are mandated to have symptom scores as part of their assessment of response. And I, I think the reason that symptoms have become less important is that we've recognised that they're not very sensitive and they're not very specific. So, so plenty of patients who are in remission, so their inflammation has gone away, will still have symptoms. And those patients will not be helped by having escalation of anti-inflammatory drugs or immunosuppression. And there are also, unfortunately, patients who always feel quite well and, and despite that have very active disease. And, and we now know that... Uh, treating um, to, 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 a, to a target of making that inflammation go away does have a long-term benefit. So, so when infliximab was, was licensed in the UK back in 2002, it was only approved by NICE for severe symptomatic Crohn's. And I almost see nobody that would meet their definition of severe symptomatic Crohn's these days, fortunately. Um, but, but I think over time, uh, I guess as both the cost of that drug has come down enormously and we've recognised the importance of normalising uh, these, these markers of inflammation, then, then our treatment goals have shifted from symptoms alone to symptoms plus biochemical markers of inflammation like caprotectin uh, and also endoscopic markers. And, and, um, and we know that these correlate really well with good long-term outcomes. Okay, now we, we, later on you're going to tell us about some really interesting work you've been doing on on really patient-centred uh, care and patients, you know, very much involved in their their, their ongoing management uh, uh, and care. In terms of looking at treatment response, is there is there sometimes a tension between what the patient defines as uh, a treatment response and what the clinician does, because ultimately, you know, what patients want is to feel better. And so uh, there's a absolutely, and I, and I think one of the one of the um, crimes that I'm most guilty of, and inflammatory bowel disease doctors are in clinic, is a, is I think of jubilation of of a normalisation of an of an inflammatory response in a patient that's had a really poor symptomatic response to treatment. And and I think it, it's quite easy as a subspecialist to. Tr try to distance yourself from what, what is the commonest cause of residual symptoms, which is irritable bowel syndrome and functional symptoms, and say, well, you know, my, my real expertise is in inflammatory disorders. But actually, I think having, having a systematic strategy to manage functional disorders is, is completely essential because they're so common. And we know that because of bowel damage and inflammatory bowel disease, things that I think would be put under the umbrella of functional disorders are more common and, and you need to be able to manage those as well. And, and um, you know, I remember many years ago in, in doing chest medicine that there, were, there was emerging quite good evidence that, that uh, whilst the assessment of asthma was most clearly and definitively made in, a, in, the, in an acute setting by arterial blood gases, patients were not attending because of fear of the invasiveness and the pain of, a, of an arterial blood uh, gas um, yeah. assessment. You know, is there a concern, is it a debate within the IBD community that being uh, purist about uh, means to assess treatment response may impact on patient engagement? I mean, in, in simplistic yeah. terms, it may yeah. well be that a patient is going to be much more amenable to having their disease assessed with a calprotectin than a small bowel biopsy, for example. Is that is that a, an issue or not? Absolutely. So, so our, 
our colleagues Stuart Taylor and Andrew Plum have looked at patients' uh, acceptance and, and tolerability of different modalities of assessing their IBD, and there's a, a clear spectrum of uh, satisfaction uh, with, with invasive tests like colonoscopy really at the end of the line and, and quite unpopular because of the bowel prep and, and discomfort during the procedure. Um, MRI actually is not rated very highly for patients with Crohn's disease because it can be uncomfortable and challenging to drink a large volume of mannitol if you've got stricture in Crohn's disease. Uh, whereas ultrasound and calprotectin and blood tests, uh, patients rate them very highly. And I think you should always choose the least invasive test. But I think you, you need to... Uh, uh, I think patients buy into the idea that normalizing inflammation is a preventative strategy and that um, by preventing bowel damage and ongoing inflammation, you're reducing the risk of surgery and cancer and admission to hospital. And I think m most patients are sold by that argument. Okay, great. And that's really interesting. Um, let's move on to, um, to, to, to treatment um, again. Um, you know, when I was a registrar several decades ago, you know, you, you, you made the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease and, you know, everybody started on, they might have started on a 5-ASA, they often started on uh, oral steroids and uh, only if they ran into trouble did you start thinking about other medications. And I, and I just give us a, a brief overview of where we are on the you know, what is simplistic, simplistically called the, uh, you know, top down, bottom up uh, uh, approach to, to, to management of IBD. Yeah, I, I think um, we're not, uh, I think the, the kind of evidence supporting what to do is still emerging, but, but I can tell you where my practice is at the moment. So all new patients I try to risk stratify and we now know that there are particular markers of disease that uh, that are associated with a poor long-term response so onset of disease at a young age having first degree relatives with inflammatory bowel disease or presenting at a time where you require steroids or even surgery at first presentation and and, and we recognize that these patients need earlier introduction of biologic therapies um but, but, but I think that the work there is not finished and there's lots of different scoring systems, none of which have really made it into routine clinical practice for, for that assessment process. There's also lots of trials looking at genetic markers or other personalized uh, medicine markers. Again, not, none of those have made it into clinical practice in, in the UK. Um, so, but, so can I just ask, is yeah. it, are we moving to a position in which um, steroids are a holding measure before the introduction of biological agents. So if a patient is deemed re to require at presentation at diagnosis steroids, then they are, they are self-selecting uh, themselves to fall in a group of probably needing early biologics, or is that, you know? Yeah, I, th I, I think that, that is an, an independent marker of a more active disease course, and and that uh, makes makes the patient very likely to need biologics. Yeah, so I think any any patient who has a course of steroids needs to have a disease assessment at the end of that course of steroids. And unless there's really clear evidence that they've gone back into remission, which is very rare, that they they should be started on on uh, on uh, biologic therapy at that point. But, yeah. but but again, when you're using the term remission in this setting, yeah. Um, uh, you know, so many will have gone. Many, am I right in saying that many will have achieved symptomatic remission? That's but right. When one is then, you know, looking at histological remission or whatever, it's a very different story. Is that is that? So, so I'd be looking for for biochemical remission uh, in UC. I'd be looking for a calprotectin in our in our local centre less than two hundred and fifty with symptomatic remission. And I think if they weren't meeting those two endpoints, then I would be starting treatment because I think steroid use is still higher than it should be in the UK and globally, and, um, and, and under treatment is still a bigger problem nationally than, than, than the, other, the other direction. And, and are, we, uh, are we increasingly, you know, skipping over traditional second line immunosuppression, the azathioprines, et cetera, uh, yeah. to, to, to get to biologics or? So, so everyone in the UK and I'm sure in other countries will have local prescribing um, guidelines which they will need to re adhere to for reimbursement reasons. And, um, and I've spent a lot of time in the last 
two years working on our prescribing guidelines, trying to bring them up to date with the latest evidence about treating to, to these targets of inflammatory remission rather than symptomatic remission. Um, but I think if you are restricted in your prescribing, then, then the very best thing you can do is set uh, a, a time limit for your assessment of whichever treatment you're trying. And, and really, that should be no more than 12 to 14 weeks before you, before you change. And if you're not reaching your target at that point, um, I think many patients spend six to 12 months uh, talking to their GP before they even get referred and diagnosed with IBD. So uh, it, perhaps in an ideal world, pa patients would be jumping on to biologic therapy earlier. But I think if there are prescribing restrictions, being time limited in your assessment of response to, to thiopurines is, is fine as well. Okay, great. Um, let's, let's talk a bit about biological agents. Um, now, clearly, we could spend, uh, well, I couldn't, but you could spend uh, half a day talking about the different biological agents. Um, but but could you give us just a you know a, a, a brief overview of where the you know where the science is um, and where we are with the 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 biological agents that are you know at present in in evidence based use um, and the ones that are likely to change management and are likely to become available and then we'll we'll then come on to discuss the uh you know the 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 the, the restrictions and the implications the financial pressures etc which i think we can't uh um you know we can't ignore so yeah um, uh, so tell us about so on the market at the moment um there are four anti-tnfs uh, although because of uh, patent reasons infliximab and adalimumab are, are no longer on patent and are available as a biosimilar preparation which is um, substantially cheaper than every other biologic and in our in our area and in many areas of the uk these are primarily for cost reasons, first choice uh, biologics for patients where there are no other specific um, considerations. Um, then uh, in the last five years, we've had three new drugs. Uh, so anti-IL-23 drugs like istokinumab, which is the first in that family, um, anti-integrin drugs, which block white blood cells going out of the bowel uh, going out of the blood into the bowel, uh, and vedolizumab is, is the only one on the market and uh, JAK inhibitors. So tofacitinib is a oral JAK inhibitor that's only approved for ulcerative colitis in the UK. Uh, but there are two other JAK inhibitors that have recently completed successful phase three clinical trials um, and will be, I, I suspect, will be available for prescribing within the next 12 months for, for both, for, for Crohn's as well. The, uh, the, they, there are regulatory approvals for, for those drugs. There are other anti-R23s in the pipeline, and there's some debate in the immunology field about whether uh, more specifically blocking IL-23 rather than IL-12 and 23, which as to kinema blocks, is, is uh, helpful. There's no head-to-head -head data that I've seen showing that to be the case, but Rizankizumab is the first of these new generation, perhaps more potent anti-R23 blockers. And, and this drug is has also completed a successful phase three program and is, is, is uh, undergoing a review for for, for licensing um, and, and can I ask you know clearly we can't go I, I, into the you know the molecular uh, basis for all of these drugs but are there are, are there reasons to believe that some of these classes of drugs are going to be more promising in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's are there uh, wh where are the 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 concerns and the, the 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 potential for these different drugs uh, can you say a little bit about that yeah i mean that's a big question i think um but one thing i would say and i uh and, and it's it's uh, not not a very original observation but i do think it's important is that the distinction between uc and crohn's is somewhat artificial so the the genetic risk factors are far more similar than they are different and many of the inflammatory pathways uh are, are important in in both um that we target and and i think it's telling that outside of 
tofacitinib, there are, there are no biologic agents that we use that are not available for both and, and don't work for both. Um, and I think it's, it's almost uh, you know, disappointing that that's, that's as far as we've got with our understanding of, of the two conditions. So none of the drugs that are on this slide uh, are, are particularly selective for, for either condition. Um, and in terms of in terms of you know what, what risks or, or or what advantages I see, I think the the, the jack inhibitors I think come with but uh, both a really big promise, but also probably a, a significant risk. So um, Janus kinase signaling is important in many different. Um, uh, cytokine pathways, but as a result, uh, there have been quite a range of different uh, adverse events observed in clinical trials. And I think where they fit into the treatment will depend on um, uh, how, how um, uh, what, what the age of the patient is, what the comor com comorbidity of the patient is, and what the risks of, of these treatments end up uh, panning out to be. Because outside of that, these are going to be oral treatments, which taking a long view will be available in very very cheap generic forms in the future which could be utterly transformative for for patients and and um are all of these drugs um you know regular long use drugs for the management of this disease yeah so so there's no um none of these drugs will cure the disease and uh, and i think that it, there, there are no treatments in trial that I'm aware of that really propose to do that. Um, so there's, there's recently, uh, a, a trial has recently closed, which was a, a hematopoietic stem cell trial for patients with very refractory to treat Crohn's disease. And I think there's always been a feeling that for people with a genetic basis to their inflammatory bowel disease, perhaps you could transplant bone marrow, either their own or, or somebody else's, and that would be helpful. But unfortunately, the risks of that um, whole process of, of conditioning and transplant um, led, led to some adverse events and the trial has been stopped. So there's, there's, I'm not aware of any treatments that really propose a cure on the horizon. Okay. And, and again, there are so many different approaches to IBD. Do you want to say a few comments about um, approaches that are often uh, of interest to patients, you know, dietary approaches, you know, you mentioned uh, um, uh, bone marrow transplant, you know, fecal transplant, dietary manipulation of, of these, you know, is the evidence base building for these? Yeah, I think if I go through this, um, maybe one by one, I think, I think that the evidence for diet uh, it has really come out for Crohn's disease more than ulcerative colitis. Um, so, so we all know that exclusive liquid diet is a really good way of putting putting children and, in fact, adults into into remission from from their Crohn's disease. But it's not sustainable to continue on uh, on on liquid diet for forever. Um, so, uh, an Israeli group have come up with a diet called the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, which is a um, a mix of some some liquid supplements and then a, a quite a restricted diet um, that's that's not dissimilar to a white diet. I, I won't describe the whole diet because it's very complicated, but people have, have shown that, that diets like the CDED, the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, can be sustained uh, and people can come on and off those diets and, and manage their disease. And there's, I think there's a, a reasonably good evidence that that uh, at least leads to a symptomatic and biochemical remission over the length of the trial. Although whether people can do that for five years or 10 years, I, I don't know. But I think if you're very motivated, I think, I think there are some evidence-based options like that. Okay. And actually that, that, that links quite nicely with, uh, I think, with your, the work you've been doing uh, in, in, you know, empowering patients. Um, you know, I think one of the attractions for, for diet may be that patients feel they're not just being given a very expensive infusion or a very expensive drug, but they're, they're you know, in, in, with all the anxieties about a chronic disease, they are able to get some level of control. Um, you've been sort of harnessing that with the um, uh, the the study at uh, and, and the program at uh, UCH to uh, 
um, you know, give patients, you know, some level of control over their management and uh, interaction with the clinicians. Tell, tell us a bit, uh, tell us what that is. Yeah, that's right. So um, most of the big electronic health systems like Epic or Cerner will have patient facing apps. And uh, we ha send out symptom scores to all patients that are disease specific. So you get the Harvey Bradshaw index if you have Crohn's or the simple colitis activity index if you have UC. And you can see what it looks like to the patient on the left there. And in about 20 seconds, the patient can tell us um, how they're feeling and we've shown that that correlates very well with the fish physicians collecting that data um, and, and their disease activity and we we have now started to integrate that into our clinic in a, in a few different ways so one way that's helpful is when patients are unwell and they have a high score uh, rather than waiting them to come to clinic and be invited to do a blood test or a fecal calprotectin, those patients uh, receive that test automatically. And that can take a step out of their, their uh, um, investigations before getting on the right treatment. And for patients who are well, we've taken, taken a, a, a different avenue. So patients who keep scoring, uh, who have a very low score, we've moved on to a virtual pathway where they have the option to initiate a patient, uh, initiate a clinic um, and, uh, and can do that if they score above a certain threshold but while they remain low are on a virtual review uh, for up to two years and our, our population is growing as it is everywhere um, and, uh, and and these might be ways that we can manage the growing numbers. Yeah that, that's uh, um, uh, very interesting and and um, you know do you have feedback as yet that you know patients are uh, you know, appreciate this. They like not having a fixed clinic appointment, but being able to um, to interact in this way. And presumably, I know we've got a fantastic group of um, specialist IPD uh, nurses at uh, at UCL. It's, it would strike me as quite difficult to run this without that fantastic service, or it's yeah. a way round that uh, you know you can avoid the need for practice nurses if you have this I imagine not no no I think uh, the only way we've made this work is with a real root and branch approach talking to our secretaries all of my colleagues and the CNSs and our local patient panel because uh, patients need to feel like these results are being looked at and having an impact on their clinical care and we have five and a half thousand patients on our books and I can't look at all of the clinical scores that are coming in and that's where uh, all of the members of the team are really important and I think what most patients that we've surveyed and, and obviously there's a little bit of a bias because if you ask them questions on this platform and they respond through the platform you're selecting to patients that are using it but um, but most patients do do, do like this platform as long as they feel like when they're unwell they can access care care quickly and they, they feel like the trade-off between perhaps being seen less when they're well um, is is acceptable if they're seen more quickly when they're unwell okay and 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 i would imagine that you're getting you you may acquire um you know a chronology of data yeah that's going to allow you to assess change you know or you know it's it's human nature that when patients come to see you in clinic, even it's, if it's a, a pre-booked clinic, they, of course, as we all would, are much more focused on what their symptoms have been like over the last week. Yes. Um, when, in fact, what, what this data, I would imagine, um, uh, may do is allow a, a, a much broader view and a much clearer view of patient symptoms over a much uh, longer and consistent period of time. Yeah, and, and the research opportunities with this are, are enormous, and, and I think that's always been in our mind as well. Okay. Um, yeah, Paul, we're, we're actually crikey, the time's gone by. We're, we're pretty much uh, we're we're pretty much through. A bit of fantastic uh, and uh, well, for me, really interesting discussion because it's not something I do as a as as I've just uh, made perfectly clear uh, by my ignorance. It's not something I do as a day job. Um, uh, what would your take home points be if there were a couple of things you wanted me and other delegates um, to to take home about the very rapidly moving field of IBD you know what do you see as the bullet points of how things are going to change yeah. uh, over the next decade 
So I think uh, the most important thing for your patients right now is define your treatment target with some objective measure of inflammation. So, so listen to your patient's symptoms, but use an endoscopic imaging or biochemical measure and make sure the patient's got got to that uh, target and if they haven't changed the treatment so we've seen the list of treatments is growing uh, and, and we don't have to worry really you know that that's going to run out we we need to make sure that we're treating to that target get get the patient in remission and don't leave patients unwell for, for longer than that time frame i think there are some really big unanswered questions about which drug to choose and and maybe that's something we could talk about on an, on another on another appointment but i think that will depend on on the cost of the drug uh, primarily for most people around the world at the moment but i think in the long run i'm hoping we can personalize that in in other ways but uh, but i think those are the most important things um yeah, yeah fantastic and and you know this is our you know our, our first uh venture into inflammatory bowel disease within within uh, the the gastro learning live platform and i think that you know it's it's perfectly obvious that it's such a massive field we need to get you back we need to um you know focus down in in other areas including you know the interesting discussion about um uh, uh about you know how we make the diagnosis um and then you know the ever-changing field of, of treatment is 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 extraordinary really. so paul um you know, fantastic to have you uh, with us. Thank you for the questions that have come in. We will try and uh, uh, respond to them. And thank you, everybody, too, for uh, attending this evening.